I am Christina Davis Kankanamgay. I also go by Dr. Davis K in our clinic um, for our patients. We're going to be talking about uh, abnormal uterine bleeding and menstrual suppression today. Our objectives are to define abnormal uterine bleeding, to um, discuss the reasons for menstrual suppression, and then also to discuss the options for menstrual suppression. Um, overall, the identification of abnormal menstrual bleeding is very important for our adolescent females, as this is an early warning sign and a vital sign for things to come as they grow into adulthood. Uh, conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome can be identified in adolescents, which leads to increased risks of certain types of cancer, such as endometrial cancer, or um, heart disease or an increased risk of diabetes. It can also be important to identify um, abnormal menstrual bleeding in the setting of bleeding disorders as teenagers often have not had surgical challenges and once a bleeding disorder is identified, surgical um, planning is more in depth if a surgical need arises. Um, abnormal uterine bleeding is anything that's outside of the normal frequency, duration, or amount of usual vaginal bleeding during a menstrual cycle. Excessive blood loss should be based on the patient's perception. However, teenagers often need some help identifying how much bleeding they're really having. So our first question, what is a normal number of hygiene items? A, two pads per day. B, two tampons and two pads per day. C, three pads and three tampons in a day. Or D, five tampons and five pads in a day. So this is going to be what would be normal and you can answer all that would be considered normal. And more than one answer is correct. Okay, so it looks like A and B and C are the more normal bleeding patterns, which is um, I would consider correct. So normal is three to six hygiene items in a day, um, bleeding that starts between 21 and 45 days from the previous first day of the cycle, or lasting less than seven days. Abnormal uterine bleeding is any bleeding that is over seven days, any bleeding that uses more than six hygiene items in a day that is fully saturated, or um, shorter intervals every 21 days, or longer intervals between 45 days. Even just having one cycle that is greater than 90 days apart is considered abnormal. Any bleeding that's heavy and associated with easy bruising or a family history is also considered abnormal. So that which brings us to our next question. If you're suspicious of heavy bleeding, what additional questions do you all ask of your patients? So family history, fatigue, any other questions? Let's see. Does your mom have heavy bleeding? That's an awesome question to ask. Do they, does it go through clothes? That's a great question for quantifying how heavy the bleeding is. Family history of bleeding disorders. Some other questions that we want to um, ask include specifically a family history of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, within the adolescent community and families, certain families have heavy bleeding and patients have been normalized to heavy bleeding by their mothers and aunts. It's important to understand if those women have had early hysterectomies for heavy bleeding, if they have had to be on birth control their entire life because of heavy bleeding, or if they had problems at birth that led them to have additional procedures after birth to control a postpartum hemorrhage. If a patient says that they have easy bruising or bleeding, I'll also ask about the length of time for nosebleeds. Any nosebleeds that last less than 10 minutes would be considered normal, but a nosebleed lasting greater than 10 minutes or needing hospital to go to the ER to become controlled would be considered indications to check for a bleeding disorder. Um, for bruising, I, want to, I also ask whether or not patients have hematoma formation underneath the skin, if it rounds and um, is felt underneath the skin, or if it's just a flat bruise. Um, if they're having hematoma formation, that would also be an indication to check for a bleeding disorder. Um, patients are often just saying, well, it's a lot of bleeding. So we have this great chart that's called the Pictorial Blood Assessment chart. It's available online. It is a validated tool that patients can use, take home, 
and um, quantify the amount of bleeding and saturation that they do in each, uh, with each cycle. Um, it is a scored um, tool and um, it allows us to see if there's an improvement with medication and treatment as well. This is also available in apps. Um, the Canadian Hemophilia Society has an app that you can download for your patients as well. Um, I'm going to transition to Dr. Chimpsum Oleka. She is a board certified pediatric LS and gynecologist as well. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Davis, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so the question is to bleed or maybe not to bleed. So let's talk a little bit more about that. In 60 AD, there was a guy by the name of Pliny the Elder who was a geographer and a naturalist, and he wrote an encyclopedia entitled Naturalist Historia. And in the human biology section, specifically on menarche, he wrote this. Contact with the monthly flux of women turns new wine sour, makes crops wither, kills grass, dries seeds in gardens, causes the fruit of trees to fall off, dims the bright surface of mirrors, dulls the edge of steel and the gleam of ivory, kills bees, rusts iron and bronze, and causes a horrible smell to fill the air. <laughs> Dogs who taste the blood become mad and their bite becomes poisonous, as in rabies. <laughs> this is actually an encyclopedia that was widely referenced and read throughout the, t the time at that period of time. And a lot of people adopted this mindset that that's exactly what that was. And that's carried over into the attitudes that we have today towards menstruation. Most people will kind of tend to look at menstruation as a type of social stigma. And this is perpetuated further on in product advertisements and that they brag and kind of talk about how easy it is to conceal your cycles. And there's a lot of shame and secrecy around menstruation and a lot of women will work hard to conceal the fact that they're actually even on their cycles. And this was published in Psychology of Women Quarterly in 2004. And they wrote that women as members of a culture that sexualizes or objectifies their bodies are motivated to distance themselves from bodily functions such as menstruation. And because they're deemed as incompatible with their desirability and attractiveness. And this goes further to say that the higher the level of self-objectification, the more likely the negative attitudes and emotions surrounding menstruation. So there's a lot of confidence that actually goes into how we view our cycles um, and how society views our cycles. There was a book that was published in 1999 entitled, Is Menstruation Obsolete? This was a controversial book. It wasn't as popular because it was trying to depopularize the idea of monthly menses. And it posed the question and made the statement that while menstruation may be culturally significant, it is not actually medically meaningful. So what do you guys think? So to move on, we'll talk a little bit about menstrual suppression or menstrual manipulation, which is essentially the use of contraceptive methods in order to decrease the frequency or the amount of menses. And this can be prescribed for adolescents in order to treat menstrual disorders or as a result of patient preference. And the overall goal is really to decrease the amount of menstruation and the flow of menstruation. We don't have anything that will 100% take away the cycles in a medication form. There actually is no medical indication for menses to occur monthly. About a third of adolescents who do so, um, who use combined oral contraceptives are actually doing so for uh, reasons such as this, as well as for non-contraceptive reasons. There can be a lot of uh, conditions, a plethora of conditions that can be treated via menstrual suppression or manipulation. That can be patient preference, you can have menstrual related problems such as dysmenorrhea or pelvic pain. Um, you can also have conditions that can be further exacerbated during the menstrual cycle such as migraines or headaches, malignancies, any hematologic abnormalities such as bleeding disorders, von Willebrand's disease, um, as well as menstrual hygiene, particularly obviously for girls with developmental delay or physical um, disabilities, this can be a really hard time for both the patients and for the caregivers. So there's different methods of menstrual suppression. You can use combined oral con or combined hormonal contraceptives, or you can use progesterone only contraceptives. In terms of the combined hormonal contraceptives, you can use combination oral contraceptive pills. Um, you can use the pills in a 42, 63, or 84 day sequence. So for simplicity, we can say one month, two month, three month. Um, and then after the continuous hormones, you can have a seven day hormone free interval, or you can do a seven day low dose ethanol estradiol interval. And there are some hormonal contraceptives that actually have that ethanol estradiol built into the hormone free um, period. There's like a low, low estrin or a seasonique. 
Um, you can use the pills continuously until bleeding occurs and then stop the medication for a short period of time. Or you can just use it continuously through the bleeding. The main thing to, to remember is that breakthrough bleeding will decrease the longer that you're using it. About 72% of the patients will reach amenorrhea within that first year of continuous use. The transdermal patch is another option, but it's rarely used as first line, mainly because the systemic estrogen levels can get up to about 1.6 times um, that higher than the lower dose combined oral contraceptive pills. Um, but it can be used for those that do find daily pills challenging. The vaginal ring is another option, and this can be used in those who have poor pill compliance or multiple other medications. The longer that you do use the vaginal ring, you do have a higher risk of having unscheduled bleeding, but that just goes from if you're using it for one month versus two months, you'll have a three-day unscheduled bleeding versus a five-day unscheduled bleeding, so it increases by about two days. In terms of progesterone-only contraceptive options, the more commonly used options are going to be your Depo, um, which is the Depo Medroxy Progesterone Acetate or the levonorgestrel IUD. Some of you might have heard of the more common one, Mirena. Um, initially, irregular bleeding is common and expected, but amenorrhea rates can be about 40% with the levonorgestrel IUD and up to about 70% with the Depo. And so that's where it's important if you're counseling them up front that you may have a little bit of irregular bleeding in the beginning, stick through it, it's gonna get better. They're usually more apt to continue the regimen. And levonorgestrel IUDs are supported by ACOG, particularly also for this use. In terms of progestin-only contraception, the pills and the implant, the etonogestrel implant, which is Nexplanon, which is on the market now, they're not typically recommended because they have a high breakthrough bleeding rate. About 22% of the patients will actually get the implant removed due to bleeding issues. Um, and menstrual suppression only approaches that of about 14 to 20% with these methods. So they're not as commonly used for this purpose. GnRH agonists do have high rates of amenorrhea, up to about 95% after four weeks. However, they do have long-term consequences because you're essentially putting an adolescent into menopause. So it's not something that could be used for a long-term um, situation, more so in those patients with oncologic issues or if they failed other previous medical management. So what's the main side effect of extended cycles or continuous regimen and the primary reason that people would discontinue it? Is it weight gain? mood swings, irregular bleeding, or poor compliance? What do you guys think? All right, so actually, the main side effect is going to be irregular bleeding. That's gonna be the most annoying thing for these patients and the reason why they'll wanna discontinue their regimen. So how do we manage that? How can we help them? So different approaches um, can be taken to help manage irregular bleeding. You can shorten the interval between your scheduled withdrawal bleeds. So what does that mean? If you're doing scheduled withdrawal bleeds every three months and they're having breakthrough bleeding continuously through that, then you can just shorten the interval. Try two months instead of the three months. And then once they're um, good with that, then you move on to three months if they wanna do that method. You can also switch to an entirely different method. Maybe that one just wasn't working for them. You can combine various methods. If they have the levonorgestrel IUD, for example, and they're having breakthrough bleeding, you can try a combined oral contraceptive pill on top of that if they have no estrogen contraindications, or you can try also a progesterone-only pill on top of that. Um, unscheduled hormone-free intervals, which we'll talk a little bit more further on, and then scheduled NSAIDs, actually um, NSAIDs, particularly like naproxen or Aleve, which has a longer duration of use, can decrease the amounts of bleeding up to about 40% if used continuously. And then you can also prescribe any add-back therapies to that as well. You also always want to assess compliance with pill taking. They may have irregular cycles because they forgot it for a week, which happens. Um, so a good way to ask that is to say, how many times a week do you forget your pill? And so that kind of opens that that invite for them to say, oh, I forget it this amount of times, rather than saying, have you missed it at all, or things like that, they're a little bit less apt to be a little more open to help you figure out what's going on. So let's talk about unscheduled hormone-free intervals. For example, if they're on the continuous oral contraceptive pill and they're having over seven days of unscheduled bleeding, you just take a break. And this will vary depending on provider. Some will do three days, some will do five days. But you take a break for about three days, just have a hormone-free interval and then restart. If they're doing the, ring, the vaginal ring continuously and they're having over five days of unexpected bleeding, then you can take a break for four days and have them resume the vaginal ring after that. The important thing to also remember is that hormone-free intervals should not exceed a frequency of three weeks because then you do lose the contraceptive efficacy behind that. There are some concerns that you will address 
if you choose to adopt this practice. In terms of patients, a lot of the parents will ask, what about fertility? Will this impact their fertility? There has been no known impact on uh, fertility. In fact, there was a study that showed that about 86% pregnancy rate is possible after the 13 months of continuous cycle use. And that's pretty consistent with the 6% to 12% infertility and fecundability rates within the nation. There's also no data to suggest or confirm an increased risk of cancer. Most gynecologists will generally be comfortable with prescribing this, but um, adolescent healthcare providers and pediatricians are a little bit less um, comfortable, which is why we're talking about this today. Other concerns include long-term bone health, um, particularly with the depo. Um, adolescents with depo um, have been shown to have a decrease in bone density, and the US FDA did issue a black box warning, particularly on this. However, the long-term skeletal health of adolescent patients has not been shown to be compromised, meaning there has not been an increased risk of fractures displayed in this particular group of, of adolescents in the future. They did do a study, which was referenced in that 2010 paper in contraception, where they looked at 98 girls, which was actually the largest study that looked at adolescents using depo to date. Um, and they looked at 12 to 18 years old girls who had used depo for up to five years. They did serial DEXA scans both before, during, and after, and saw that 37% had over an 8% loss in their bone density. But this was regained after they discontinued the depo two years after that. So they were at their baseline um, of bone density after that. And there was some uh, evidence to suggest that using calcium and vitamin D concurrently did help to decrease the amount of bone loss that occurred. ACOG does not recommend limiting depo use to two years or monitoring bone mineral, de bone mineral density um, after two years of depo use. You do want to keep in mind just the overall patient. Obviously, this should be um, individualized to the uh, particular patient, but also weighing, weighing um, benefits and risks. In terms of expecting bleeding patterns after one year, the least bleeding is really going to come with the combined um, oral contraceptives. You can have a one and a half day per 90 day period of having unscheduled bleeding and an amenorrhea rate of up to 72%. Um, followed by the other extreme where you have the eosinogestural implant, which is the next one on, you can have about 19 days of unscheduled bleeding per a 90 day period. The IUD, all the other ones were falling kind of somewhere in between that. And obviously the IUD will have you at about 50%, um, mostly about a 40, 20 to 40 percent after the first year and then that continues um, for the remaining four years that it's on. That also does get better the longer that it's in. In Newsweek in 2016, they published an issue and this was on the front page cover. This was really remarkable um, because prior to that in 2015 it had been the year of the period. And so this started, the, <laughs> this started the, the fight to kind of end period shaming and you can see there's a big tampon on the cover and they're trying to end the period stigma. Um, and there's a lot that goes into this. This is a $3.1 billion uh, business in terms of feminine hygiene products. And these products are all taxed, whereas things like potato chips and Viagra are things that aren't taxed. Um, in India, in other developing countries, about one in five girls will actually drop out of school after they start menstruating due to the inadequate facilities to manage periods. That's a lot, a lot, you know? And so the take home point from this is not to say that no one should have periods and everyone should be on suppression. Um, but the point is that if the period is affecting their quality of life on a daily basis, there is an alternative to consider. And within the Newsweek article, it did say that menstrual periods do not kill anyone, usually. Um, but it is still an important issue <laughs> because it affects how girls view themselves and how they affect confidence. So Rupi Kaur is a Canadian poet. She's of Punjabi descent. And she actually started this photo project to demystify the period and make something innate normal again. And she posted this on Instagram. It was reported to Instagram and taken down. She posted it again. It was taken down. All these social media sites wouldn't let her post this picture because it showed her bleeding onto her um, bed. And so she was trying to kind of demystify that. And she wrote a poem called Period. And it basically says this, we menstruate and they see it as dirty, attention seeking, sick, a burden, as if this process is less natural than breathing, as if it is not a bridge between this universe and the last, as if this process is not love, labor, life, selfless, and strikingly beautiful.